This is Hanson Sue. Um, in here interviewing Dr. Brad Cox uh, at his home in Manassas, Virginia. Uh, it is August 2nd, 2016. Um, and uh, what what do you prefer to be called? Brad. Brad? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, we'll start by um, asking you some biographical questions. Um, so um, where, where and when were you born? I was um, born in Fort Benning, Georgia, uh, toward the end of the Second World War. Hmm. And uh, then uh, my parents moved to my father's birthplace in South Carolina. And he was a dairy farmer. So I spent my life, uh, my, my youth, um, milking cows and taking care of the farm and walking in the woods and um, collecting snakes. That was my, I was known far and wide for a snake collection. <laughs> <laughs> so your, your whole family is uh, sort of Southern heritage? Yeah, pretty much. Do you have any siblings? I have a brother. Brother. He's, still in that area. Hmm. Did you have any hobbies growing up or mostly? Well, the snake living? collection and, <laughs> and walking in the woods. Behind the farm there was a sizable lake that um, actually my grandfather had dug, I think with uh, the help of slaves. Hmm. Um, I don't know for sure, that was before my time, but um, the rumor has it that either slaves or sharecroppers dug it all with wheelbarrows and shovels. And that's um, where I spent all my time, is walking around that with a twenty-two rifle. Hmm. Um, uh, what, um, do you know what your uh, parents' ethnicity was? Not exactly. We always guessed it was um, uh, Scots Irish, mm -hmm. but it was just a guess. Mm. Um, were, was your family very strongly religious, or? Oh yeah. <laughs> I was the exception. I never, I never understood it. I never got the memo. I, it just did, never sunk in ever. Uh -huh. uh, do you remember what dom denomination they were? It was. Um, Baptist at one time and then Presbyterian. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and um, any political views? Um, nothing stands out. I mean, probably a Democrat, but I, I don't really know. Mm -hmm. um, what was your education like before high school? Um, the proverbial well, it was actually three rooms, three room schoolhouse mm -hmm. um, until the ninth grade, mm -hmm. and then I skipped the ninth and went to a high school in in the nearest town, mm -hmm. and um, that was. Well, it was just a typical high school. The other one was atypically small. It was out way, way back in the boonies. Oh, wow. So until high school, you were in a, basically like a one-room school? Uh, Three-room three room school. Three room school. Um, I'm overstating. The uh, first, second, and third grades were in one room, hmm. one, one building with three rooms. Then there were a few outbuildings that took the next few grades, and then there was a high school that, um, you know, was more, more typical. Uh -huh. So I'm understating. It was more than one room, but it was small, and class sizes were small, and, huh. you know, everybody went to school barefoot in the summer. Oh, wow. <laughs> Pretty typical South, or, or stereotypically South. Right. And what was your high school experience like? Oh, typical. Um, <laughs> nothing really uh, uh, stands out um, um, as being very different. Mm -hmm. I was pretty good at it. <laughs> Were you uh, at the top of your class? Yeah. <laughs> top, top two or three. 
there were a couple of women that I couldn't quite beat. <laughs> <laughs> and what was your favorite subject? Um, probably science. Science? Yeah. <laughs> science, uh, math? Um, yeah. Um, I, I eventually ended up in chemistry, but I think that came later. Uh -huh. When I was in college, I got focused more on chemistry, but right. in high school, it, um, you don't really specialize. Right, right, yeah. Um, well, well let's, let's move on to that then. Um, it says uh, you went to college at Furman University? Yeah. Where is that? Furman University is in Greenville, South Carolina. Okay. It's a, one of these Bible Belt colleges. Mm. Um, uh, and by that time, I was in total rejection. I, I just couldn't stand the religious part of it. It was a pretty <laughs> decent college, but the, except for the religious parts of it. Hmm. Um, I eventually gravitated to chemistry. Uh, organic chemistry was my favorite. Mm -hmm. And um, at that point, I had the idea that I was going to be a a doctor when I when I graduated, um, a medical doctor. Mm -hmm. um, I eventually wised up and chose a different, <laughs> a different <laughs> path. It's not pretty what's happened to medicine since then. Oh, I see. <laughs> um, so. What was it about religion that turned you off, especially? I wouldn't say it turned me off, because I never got it. Nobody uh, ever explained why anybody would believe this when this is more obviously true. I just never understood it. I regard, I regard it now as a, as a fault. Mm. It's probably the most important um, thing that's happened to human, in all of human history is religion. Mm. I mean, history, history shows you that, but uh, I never understood. Because you were more into science, per se? Uh, I was most of all into what, what everybody tells you when you're growing up, is think for yourself. Mm. And thinking for myself didn't go that way. Okay. What was it about organic chemistry that particularly attracted you? I was good at it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and it, um, I just enjoyed it. It was, um, I, um, I got these summer scholarships to do research so I could stay there at summertime and mm -hmm. do research. And, and it was very exciting. What made you decide to uh, pursue medicine? At, at least at that time. Well, at that time, you don't know. There's so much you don't know when you're a kid. You mm -hmm. know, you don't know what the future holds or what it'd be like to work on X, and never, and you've never really heard of why. Mm -hmm. But medicine, I'd heard of, and that seemed to be the next, uh, the next step. Um, and I only got off of that when I went to graduate school. I see. I didn't go to a medical school, but um, but I chose a different path about that time. So did you did you start moving away from that when you were choosing med uh, graduate schools because you would have had to decide between grad school or med school already? I don't re recall it being a an issue. Um, I'd heard of University of Chicago's role in the war. Oh. And uh, I think that's why I chose it. Uh, what was the role? What was their role? Well, inventing the its role in inventing the A bomb. Oh, okay. And so you, you wanted to be so it was because of that, or because that's that's very far from medicine. Oh yeah, it. it Medicine or science. I, oh, okay. I, but it's just a general uh, science. Yeah, I, I steered more toward the science side right. as time went on. Right. Okay. What well, What was it like for you growing up during the Cold War? 
wondering what all the fuss was about. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, it, um, it's another one of these things where I never got the memo. I, I never understood what the, why anybody cared if somebody was a communist uh -huh. or why anybody would care enough to call themselves a communist. It, it just seemed like a, something I didn't understand. <laughs> okay. I didn't want to spend time thinking about. <laughs> right, okay. <laughs> so um, what was your first exposure to computers? That was very late. Um, the first exposure to anything like a computer was a hand crank calculator in the chemistry department oh. at, at Furman. Uh -huh. And um, I enjoyed that thing and um, uh, practiced a lot. So it was like a it was like a mechanical adding machine. I don't remember if it was mechanical or electronic. It, oh. um, it may have been a mechanical, but it may have been early um, electronics, and it was a huge thing, so maybe mechanical. Hmm. And then um, when I went to, when I got to uh, University of Chicago, um, I start. I don't know what what it was that taught that told me this, but I chose the Department of Physics, quantum quantum mechanics, uh -huh. because rumor had it that they had the uh, biggest computer budget on on campus. Okay. That there it is. That was that was the reason. Um, again, you don't know enough to make intelligent choices. So right. I was fortunate. I was chose one that I was good at. And. Um, that was the first time I got involved in computers. It was programming IBM 7094 mm. programs for molecular orbital calculations mm. on punch cards. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I read that your degree was uh, in mathematical biology. Your yeah, that, that came a couple of years later. Um, oh, so you're first doing a master's degree in physics? No, I, you, it's called, it, the um, University of Chicago lingo for it was research in a related department. Oh. So I was still in the physics department formally, but in reality what I was spending my time doing was um, mathematical biology. Oh, okay. And what drew you to that field? Um, most interesting problem I could think of to work on at that time was how the brain worked. Ah. And um, to my astonishment, that field of neural networks was mm -hmm. really what I chose. Didn't have a prayer back then. Mm. We didn't know enough. Computers were too tiny. Um, you know, a long list of things caused me to eventually get out of it because I knew it was going to be hopeless. Mm. But the astonishing thing is, within the last five or so years, right. it's beginning to catch wind big time. Yeah. So um, I'm not sorry I left it. It would have been a, right. a really miserable 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> um, Waiting, waiting for the, the breeze to come, but um, <laughs> that's really what I started in. Yeah. I mean, your first paper was on simulation of neural nets, right? Correct? Um, it was, um, if you'd call it a paper, I, I, wrote a, I wrote a little thing for DECAS, the DEC, Digital Computer uh, uh -huh. User Group. Oh, okay. It shows the computer I was doing my uh, neural networks on it was a PDP-8 with mm -hmm. a teletype and an oscilloscope, no, no <laughs> persistent screen at all, mm -hmm. and I could draw dots on it fast enough to show which neurons were firing. And uh -huh. the most primitive thing you can possibly imagine. <laughs> <laughs> um, what was your first postdoc? Pro. Oh, uh, postdoc. 
postdoctoral. Um, did you do any postdoctoral yeah. positions after you graduated? Um, that neural network project mm -hmm. was where I started on my postdoc. Oh. That was that was. Uh, I eventually I realized very soon that that was hopeless. Mm -hmm. We just didn't have enough knowledge to get progress on that. Mm -hmm. So I got involved in um, um, mathematical modeling of skid, squid giant axon firings. Ah. And um, um, got a, that was my d degree paper. Okay. And so that led directly to your postdoctoral work? That, or that, that was your postdoctoral work? Well, it was my doctoral work, doctoral which work. led directly to my postdoctoral work. Right, okay. At Woodsold. Um, what was your first uh, job after postdocs? After postdoc, um, I had a look look around at what I enjoyed doing and what I was spending my time doing, and eventually just realized that what I enjoyed about the whole process was the computer side more than the science side. Mm -hmm. So I. Um, uh, took a couple of uh, job, two jobs working in the newspaper for for newspapers that wanted to automate their newsrooms, <laughs> building these huge gold-plated um, newsroom automation systems. One for um, uh, Chicago Tribune and the other for the Toronto Star. <laughs> and then from there, I got into ITT and the more recent history. Right. So that's a good segue. Um, so how did you how did you find yourself at, I, at ITT or International International Tele Telephone and Telegraph? Was that yeah. is that a was because I mean AT and T was the monopoly, right? So was yeah, that they're a, different companies. ITT is international. ATT is America. Right. But um, ITT at the time was um, International Telecommunications. Where is and that headquartered, or was headquartered? Uh, I'm not exactly sure where the headquarters was. It's international, so mu much of its bulk was in Europe. Right. Uh, it may have been there at the time. No, I think it was New York. Rand oh. Ars Ariscog was president, and I think he was around New York. Um, don't hold me closely to these facts. Okay. I'm a little tenuous on the, the structure of that company. Right. Well, they were, they were all busy inventing the use of object-oriented programming for building telephone nets, hmm. telephone switches, and built a big researcher operation to support that. Huh. And um, that's where I met Tom Love and um, started down this trail. Right. So you had met him, but well, he had recruited you into the company, mm -hmm. and so you hadn't known him before that. No. Okay. Um, so how wh how why did he recruit you, f in particular? You know, I don't remember. I um, geography had something to do with it. They, um, I was in that, uh, living in that town near where the company was. Oh, okay. But I don't know how we got connected. And where was that? It was it New York or Connecticut? Connecticut. Connecticut. Yeah. And you, I mean, you mentioned they were they were using object oriented programming for network applications. Where they didn't call it that, but it, it was um, the way um, telephone networks are built today is with these self contained um, computers, basically. Mm -hmm. Before that, it was all these mechanical rotary switches and all that. So, ITT was building the first step away from the old way of doing telephone switches. And in retrospect, um, it behaved like an object-oriented system. They didn't think of it that way themselves at the time, but. Um, okay. Um, But that's, um, in retrospect, that's... 
because it was encapsulated? Is, is that why it was in your mind? It's it was on yeah. And in, in some way that would make you'd have to talk to a telephone engineer to to get the the um, um, the details on this. I, I I was working in computer engineering, not telephone engineering. So, but a good friend of mine, Ken Ken Hammer Hodges, was the main designer of that system, right. and uh, he's the one that made that claim later. Oh, I see. Um, how? Actually, how familiar were you with object-oriented programming? Not at all. Not at all? No. Um, I think, I mean, somewhere you mentioned that you met Adele Goldberg in graduate school yep. at Chicago. Mm -hmm. um, I guess, oh, maybe elaborate on that? Yeah, well, she... Um, uh, uh, University of Chicago had a nascent computer science department. She was a part of that. And um, she and se several others um, was sort of generally on my radar screen, but not particularly close. I knew who she was. And, um, so there's not, not a lot to say about it. Did you have a lot of contact with the computer science department in general? In grad informally, school? informally, there was not a lot of formal contact. But you were aware we were, of the thing, the ideas coming out of the department. That Basically. not not object oriented programming. I don't think she'd heard of it back then. Right, that's before she went to Xerox Park. Right. Yeah. Mainly, uh, remember everything was punch cards back then, and that was generally how you met people it was around the punch card machine. Oh, okay. So. <laughs> Waiting to uh, give them your stack. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what sorts of uh, programming language were, were you familiar with um, when you got hired to, at ITT? Assembler. Assembler. For which architecture? Uh, the mm -hmm. IBM 7094, IBM 360, and the PDP-8. Okay. All three were all assembler. And then I was mainly, I was campaigning to use Fortran mm -hmm. for some of these molecular orbital calculations, but not successfully. Mm -hmm. uh, that, Fortran was too slow, you see. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I knew Fortran, but um, I don't think I ever used it for serious work. Oh, okay. So, pretty basic. Oh, wow, yeah. Um, so, how did you, uh, so what did, what did you do for Tom Love when you got hired at ITT? Um, this was a research department with a handful of people, four or five people in it. I was one of the four or five. And um, one project was to use program generation approaches to building applications. The whole idea was we were searching for productivity, improve, ways to make productivity improvements. I see. So one theory was that uh, program generation was uh, had the legs to make a difference. By program generation, you mean the pro programs pro that write programs. Okay. Then um, Unix began to get on onto the radar screen. Mm -hmm. um, by which I mean um, you could crowbar it out of ATT's hands. <laughs> there was a way to get it. That doesn't mean you know nobody was pushing it. Right. But we thought it could make a difference to um, the productivity of the people building this telephone switch, especially for testing these um, these switches. So we found a um, company that was building this um, Unix box about the size of that coffee table there, sure. with handles oh, wow. on it. Um, 
and uh, I built a, um, a script basically that would let you control a set of computer uh, of these computers that, that made up a telephone switch so you could control more than one by using the script and that made a huge fuss and <laughs> ended up getting sent to Europe to in, introduce this thing to the people that um, um, mm, oh gosh I've forgotten the company Phillips uh, oh Phillips yeah Phillips is um, big lab there. So I made a few, big impression on a whole bunch of people. And then I think about the third thing I got involved in was building the ancestor of Objective-C. Oh, this was at ITT? Yeah. It started there? Okay. Right. Um, before we get into that, um, so why was the, the group so the group that you were in, you, I mean, you write in, in the uh, History of Objective C paper, you called it the Frame Group. Um, yeah, the Jim, Jim, Jim Frame. Jim Frame was the head of it. Was the head of it. Um, and he had been hired from IBM originally. Yeah, a lot of those folks came from IBM. <coughs> he, he brought most of his acquaintances, I, I think, it seems. Okay. And was that the reason why there was this focus on productivity? Yeah, that was the banner of the frame group was, and the the mission of that group was to make a difference in productivity. Okay. And um, was that was it was it at that time that you became familiar with Fred Brooks's work on software engineering? The mythical Fred bandwidth? Brooks. Um, It's hard to say when I first heard of Brooks. Um, it wasn't through the frame or organization that I recall. Hmm. Um, it may have been later? It may have been later, it may have not. I, ju I just don't recall. Okay, I see. Um, so, so you said that the, 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 the very beginning of Objective-C started, started there. How, so how did that project begin? What led to that? Oh. <clears throat> I'd been looking for... Uh, I wasn't happy with C as a productivity foundation. Mm -hmm. and was casting around for uh, anything I could find that might, might help. And the, that was about the time the Byte Magazine article came out. The, the Small Talk special issue? Yeah, the Small Talk. Um, 1982, I believe. Yeah. And um, there were a whole bunch of things that I had, that I vaguely thought might help. This whole encapsulation I was pretty sure about. I see. That, that was a definite, but... Uh, Why is that, that in particular? Well, C is so bad at it. <laughs> you know, there's no way to, there are no objects in C. Right. Um, essentially, everything is public. There are no, you know, it it's, it's just turns into a soup. Right. Um, and uh, the pain from that was what I was trying to escape. So, um, but there were, remember this, this was, it's looking back. It's hard to hard to remember how little we knew then. Hmm. Um, there was no internet. There was no um, you know any, anything we take for granted today that, that didn't exist yet. So there's some vague ideas I had that where where small talk might be better than C. And one of those vague ideas was it might be more more supportive of building graphical user interfaces in C was. Right. Now, in retrospect, that's just bogus. It just doesn't help that much. Oh, really? Yeah. It helps, but, it, but, it, but objects help almost anything you do. It's, it oh. has no particular advantage for 
over any other object or any tool for doing graphics. Oh, you mean Smalltalk in particular? Right. Over any other object-oriented language? Right. Um, but at the time, there weren't that many. I mean, there was Smalltalk and Simula. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> that's all there was. So, um, so you ask what I, what I saw in that paper. Those were two, th two ideas that I saw in the paper. And in retrospect, I think the second one, the graphics okay. thing, was, was not particularly um, profound, but the encapsulation was. Okay. Um, and um, after you, and, and garbage collection. Oh, okay. That also seemed important, but I couldn't see a way to do it in C without losing the reasons it made C worth having. Mm -hmm. So garbage collection was never... I spent a lot of time working on it and worrying about it, but um, it was never successfully. Right. What's... Um, could you maybe explain, like, uh, what's the nature of that incompatibility? Um, Oh, why, why it's so hard in C? Yeah. Well, C is a frame-based language. Okay. You know, every time you call a, a, a subroutine, mm -hmm. you just, you don't, you don't, it just adds a stack frame to the end of the stack. Mm -hmm. And there's no flexibility in that. Mm -hmm. So it's easy to add things on the stack and pop things off. Mm -hmm. But... Um, other than that, your only other option for storing anything, an object, if you will, is to put it on the heap mm -hmm. where, where there is no stack and there is no structure. Now you could, um, there's some steps along the way to getting garbage collection that are compatible with that, reference counting being one of the first. But nothing comparable to a to a Java style environment where everything is um, essentially everything is on the on the heap mm -hmm. and um, very tightly integrated into the language itself. Right. C C is tiny in in comparison with that, and um, it, it's just very hard to do well. Right. But you mentioned that you wanted to preserve that aspect of C. Well, that that's, was that was the. Uh, I didn't I didn't want to do it poorly in C. I didn't want. I don't know. I, I, I just struggled to do it well and never never managed. Right. Right. Okay. Um. Stepping back a little bit, um, I read that. Uh, you and um, was it Alan Watt, who mm -hmm. was a classmate? Oh, Alan Watt was working with the Frame Group at the time. Yep. Um, you you and Alan Watt visited Bill Joy, who was Watt's classmate from Reed College. What was that meeting like? Ooh, that was a long time ago, <laughs> but I remember it well. What year was that? I. I have a tar such a hard time with years, so it would be, <laughs> be in the 80s. Was um, it before the Byte magazine, the Small Talk Byte magazine came it out? It would have been after because after. this was at, no, prob probably after. This this was at ITT that we that went out there. But the first uh, visit out there, the sun was in its garage, oh. a proverbial garage. <laughs> And um, then a few years later, I went out with Alan Watt to see Bill Joy. He was in his um, graduate student office. And, at Berkeley? Uh, huh? Oh, uh, at he, Berkeley. Oh, okay. He hadn't joined Sun yet. I don't the, think so. He may have. I, I don't remember. Okay. Um, but if you ever met the guy, he talks a mile a minute. <laughs> I mean, just machine gun fast and um, I'm trying to remember now why we were there I think we were trying to choose computers for for ITT um, and trying to get support for doing it using Unix instead of 
one of these proprietary operating systems around there. I don't remember it exactly. But it's true. <laughs> Met Bill Joe in his office. <laughs> <laughs> was, did anything come out of that meeting? <clears throat> I don't remember anything tangible. Okay. Um, we, we did wind up using Sun computers. Maybe that was the outcome of it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what was it about C and, and about Unix that you guys were so committed to? Um, there there were, was no other option in those days except proprietary options. Oh, I see. And, um, but why is it, it, was it so important to not choose a proprietary option? Because you... We didn't want a, a company the size of ITT to be locked into some other particular company, probably DEC. Mm. Um, I mean, in retrospect, we we were on the right side of that war, right? But uh, it wasn't at all clear at the time, and so we were looking for whatever to mobilize whatever support we could get, thus build joy. Oh. Um, And um, I, w I had just become inc incredibly annoyed with um, proprietary languages mm -hmm. that, like Fortran, for example. Where oh, Fortran was like IBM. Well, everybody had offered Fortran, but everybody add their, added their particular spice to it. Ah. So if you ever touch that, um, those spicy parts, <laughs> which were always the attractive parts to you, <laughs> then you were you were stuck and couldn't get out of it right. in the future and that was just not acceptable. Okay. Um, I mean you mentioned that other languages like COBOL, ADA, Pascal didn't have the right qualities either. Well ADA, that was about the time of government's full port, port press and um, and I our objection to that was there's nothing in there that's demonstrably better than what you get for free with C. Okay. So uh, Pascal, um, that that turned up later to be of the main competitor at Apple, mm -hmm. but um, but it wasn't widely available. You you couldn't use. It. I mean, C was just seemed like the obvious choice. I see. Because it came with every Unix machine. Right. Yeah. So, it's going back to the um, Objective C. So the, so th this is about the time that you created the first object-oriented precompiler, that was the sort of layering small talk on top of on top of C. Right. That was at ITT in Tom's group. Okay. Um, and for you, how did how did you see that in addressing the goals of improving productivity and coordination? Well, it, um, it addressed um, productivity by bringing encapsulation to a language that didn't have any. Mm -hmm. And basically, the way, way we were thinking of our role there is trying to get object-oriented programming out of the research labs. Mm -hmm. Nobody had heard of it by then, right, except for two, two or three research labs, Xerox Park, mm -hmm. um, for most of those. So we're trying to get object-oriented programming out of the research lab, and so we had to embed it in something that we could find on the factory floor, like C, mm -hmm. something that would be acceptable um, there. Small talk wouldn't. Right. So, um, and C was already in wide use in the industry. Why I wouldn't call it wide, but um, it was well known and becoming established. Okay. By then, there were there were even companies building these suitcase size Unix machines by then. Uh -huh. um, so it, so it was it was coming 
environment, but not yet fully, not what it is today. Right. Um, where did the, where did the keyword ID for an object reference of any type come from? Oh, almost every, um, yeah, ID word was coined, um, like almost everything else in, in Objective-C that's not in, in the C. Um, we just had to coin terms, and it was a two-letter acronym that um, that um, was easy to use and uh, uh, easier name than pointer. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, does it actually stand for identifier? Is that yeah. what? Okay. Mm -hmm. Object identifier. Object identifier. Okay. Um. When did your when did the research group that you were in start to come into conflict with the larger frame organization at ITT? Oh, gosh. This is really more of Tom's history than my history. Okay. But um, Tom was deeply committed to this Unix idea. Mm -hmm and the rest of the frame organization was deeply committed to IBM products. Okay. And I think that, that split just uh, um, eventually caused time to leave. Okay. <laughs> and how, so how closely did you work with Tom? Like, were, were you, how closely did you collaborate? Oh, um, very closely. On, but on different things, I was ma mainly focused on building that uh, precompiler. Mm -hmm. He was mainly focused on getting Unix adopted inside the the organization. They're very different. Oh, okay. W what was his What was his role in um, in Objective C? Did he have any design input, or did he help implement any of it? Well, uh, at that time, he was very supportive. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he, um, but it was mostly you were the one working on it. Yeah, I, I was focused on the language, and he was focused on providing an environment for the language. Mm -hmm. now, remember, the precompiler was two jobs before Objective C. Right. Okay. So. Uh, this was at the, during the ITT period, right? And uh, he, when he left, he moved to Schlumberger Dahl Research Labs, mm -hmm. and I eventually followed him there. And then we both left to form the um, Objective C. Right. Um, so how so? How soon did you join him at Schlumberger Dahl after he left? It wasn't immediately, but. I would say months. Oh, okay. And it was for pretty much the same reason that, I mean, once he was gone, you didn't see any reason to continue working at ITT, or you didn't see any support for Unix within the organization? Uh, probably, but I honestly don't recall. <laughs> <laughs> so you um, just wanted to just keep working with Tom? Yeah, I think so. Schlumberger <laughs> Dahl seemed like a nice place. Okay. I mean, it was gold plated. It was really nice. Wow. What? So, <coughs> was there any particular <coughs> any particular reason why Tom joined that company? Nothing comes to mind. They they were local. Oh, um, okay. In Connecticut. Yeah. And. Um, very well respected. Their whole thing was applying artificial intelligence to oil field problems, huh. oil field services. So um, everything was list based, um, top of the line AI mm. uh, kind of work. Um, I think they had some interest in, in bringing in Unix, and of course, Tom and I got all involved in that. Oh, okay. Uh, then Tom 
um, managed to eke out a small talk license from Xerox uh. somehow. <laughs> uh, and he became Schlumberger's small talk program. Okay. <laughs> And what, so what else did you work on there? Um, or were you continuing to work on the, the precompiler? Or was that, or did you stop I, doing that? No, uh, I didn't work on that uh, there. Um, they were working on, the LISP group was very much involved in efforts to standardize an object-oriented extension to LISP. They were working with Danny Bobrow and um, other folks to produce what what eventually turned out to be CLOS, okay. Common List, right. uh, List Operating System. Um, what I was doing, I th I would say, supporting the um, their Schlumberger's interest in in Unix. Mm -hmm. So. There was a. They had this very gold-plated, ginormous display console for displaying oil field data. That was driven from Vax VMS, as I recall, mm -hmm. and um, we built this adapter. No, the big thing about that project w was. Um, what was it called back then? It was the predecessor of Ethernet. One of these uh, huh. first generation e Ethernet. Um, Local area network. Like yeah, but very first generation. Okay. Um, it had a name, but I forgot that now. But anyway, we you, you proving that network as a way of connecting the display console with the computational end. Okay. Projects of that nature, they, none of them really stand out in, in memory anymore. Right. So how did you, how did Tom, you and Tom decide to start your own company? He got, um, I don't know how he made this contact, but he made a contact with someone in Philips in, in Europe that needed a worldwide review of their hardware engineering operation with an idea of productivity again. Mm -hmm. And um, eventually um, that contact culminated in a contract to do a worldwide review. So we had to be away from Schlumberger to, do, to take on that contract. And oh. So we both so the did that. oh so the so so you guys became contractors basically no we started a company oh you okay you started a company then you couldn't okay so the the contact at Phillips so so Phillips wanted to um, wanted you to to do this thing for them that as employees of Schlumberger you couldn't do yes and so you decided to just branch off and and do your own thing, right. partly because of this contract. Right. Okay. And so what was, so how, uh, well, okay, obviously productivity is in the name of the company, Productivity <laughs> Products International. <laughs> um, seems pretty straightforward, <laughs> the name. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so what was the, what was the vision? What was the business plan? Um, what were you, what were you going to be selling? Um, the short answer is productivity. Now, uh, to, to make that concrete, one concrete example of it is a more productive programming language. Mm -hmm. So the productivity second, in the sense of writing software. Right. My answer to to for the second in that list was component software com, com, software components okay so the um, rhetoric that we came up with was 
first we'll produce a soldering iron, mm -hmm. and then we'll produce software ICs that can be joined together with that soldering iron. Now that was the answer that we used back then. And then, of course, there were also we were also a consulting company, okay. so um, productivity consulting was what we actually did. Okay, so trying to help other other companies improve their software product. Right. Productivity. Or hardware. Phillips was a hardware company. Oh, okay. But um, um, their whole idea is they believed object-oriented approaches could help with hardware. Huh. So that's why they brought us in, in particular. And, oh, that's interesting. So how, how would that apply? <laughs> <laughs> I never fully understood. <laughs> I, um, but, the, but they, they had a huge investment in software tools, which I did understand. Uh, and it was written in general hard, hard languages like Fortran. Which, and I understood the problems with that. So it wasn't hard to make a claim that object-oriented approaches might help with that. Okay. Um, I want to get more into the, uh, the soldering iron. Um, metaphor, um, but before I do that, um, I think I read somewhere that uh, Gerald Weinberg, the author of the Psychology of Computer Programming, was doing some work for that Phillips contract. How did that? Um, What's he involved in happen? that? He was involved in several of our projects, but I don't recall him working on Phillips. Oh, projects for, for ITT? No, or no, for, for for other customers. Oh, for after PPI. after we formed PPI. Okay. Yeah. Oh, so for, oh, so he was he was sort of one of the people that you you sometimes contracted with as part right. of the work. Right, and it may have been Phillips. I, it's just by that time I I was a hundred percent heads down working on the language side of the problem and not tracking the consulting side. Oh, okay. So I I might just not have might not might not know. Okay. How did how did he end up being one of the people that you you used as a contractor? Tom had known him some uh, from from previously. Um, then of course um, um, he. Well, he, he was sort of the all-around advisor for the company. Okay. I don't remember how how that came about, but he was very helpful and very supportive. Mm -hmm. Did any of his, his work or his ideas um, influence you or the company? Well, certainly his ideas about effective consulting okay. um, are probably the, the, the most lasting. He also was a big help in uh, helping me get my first book out. Uh, the um, the evolutionary approach yep. book. Okay. Uh, you know, um, negotiation kind of help. Uh, uh, with publishers. Help with publishers and so forth. He was a good friend. <laughs> Um, why did you seize on components as the, the solution to productivity issues, software productivity? I, because I can't think of anything more effective at achieving productivity than, than being able to lift it from here and put it down there, mm -hmm. to a component, if you will. That much of it always made perfect sense to me. Um, now, of course, in my opinion, industry has not followed that path mm -hmm. uh, with, with, any, uh, with any vigor.
Well, I don't want to overstate that. There, there are th- computer applications are components, even okay. more so than than objects. There, um, and industry has followed that very aggressively. And now there's a lot, lot more of interest in service-oriented architecture, where components are are very prominent. So I don't want to overstate it, but but in terms of of the granularity of objective C objects, right. industry has not followed that. Right. Where did you where did you first um, where did you first discover the idea of component software? Um, well, that was the ideal I saw in Solanka. Oh, okay. So you thought you saw encapsulation being being a Right, it's this membrane around a, an object. Right. And where did the where did that language, that specific term, component, software component, come from? I may it may be coined, or I may have heard there was there was at one time an uh, academic interest in um, component C. C, it had a three-letter acronym, C something. Um, compo- component-based software, probably, C- CBES. Um, but I, I don't recall reading reading about it. It was just a, a term that captured the, the ideal that we saw. There. Okay. Um. I want to get back to the uh, the soldering iron in the software IC metaphor. Um, where did that metaphor come from? It was coined. <laughs> it, it it just captured what I liked about the Objective C approach and what set it apart from the C plus plus approach. Uh huh. Um, Which was um, you you've talked about a C plus plus is more of a fabrication plant. Right. It's a very labor-intensive, um, uh, highly efficient, um, very compressed mm-hmm. development compared to the arm's length approach that you have in Objective C, mm-hmm. the soldering iron approach. Right. But why use these sort of hardware metaphors? Um, right. Why not use other metaphors? Why not use biological metaphors? Why not use, like why? Why was the sort of this hardware metaphor so important? I, I it just seemed more approachable than biological. I mean, one that uh, would be more understandable to everybody. To and, computer people. Well, everybody, literally, but yes, computer people. Okay. Um, I don't. I don't recall ever giving it much thought. It just seemed like the, the right, uh, <laughs> the right metaphor to use. I see. Okay. Um, so then, where did the name Objective C originate? And when did you start using it? It wasn't until PPI days, and then we needed a product name, and um, that one popped out. Okay. <laughs> it so was you... coined like like so many things. Okay. And you, so when you so when, it's like when you formed PPI, you had already decided that the language was going to be one of your products. Yeah, yeah. Um, Even when the contracting was going on, you were working on the language? Um, because that was a department. Yeah, while we were, I remember while we were at Schlumberger, we were talking about what next after the con- consulting contract, what, what products would we build? Mm-hmm. And um, we knew about this pre compiler that I worked on at ITT, and mm-hmm. I said, why not that? Why not turn that into a product? Mm-hmm. So, 
it, it must have been Schlumberger days. Okay. <laughs> and so what what did that involve turning the precompiler into a a full blown language into a real language? Oh, oh multiple iterations. Remember, um, I had no background in language design, so I had to train myself in how to do that. Mm -hmm. And um, the first attempts weren't pretty. <laughs> <laughs> and so we just iterate the problem until, until we came out with a pretty good tool. I see. And I mean, in keeping with the, uh, the soldering iron approach, it was basically just minimal, just the minimum amount necessary to create a small talk like environment. The early Oopsie. versions were, were totally minimal. In fact, Oopsie is the, the early version. Right. Um, that, all, uh, big portions of that were just done with Unix shell scripts. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, and then, of course, uh, uh, as we went down that trail at PPI, uh, I got spun up on tools like Lex and Yak. Uh huh. And Actual parse, parse tools. Right. And then got better and better. Eventually, when we got investment, uh, we brought in people that had a background in doing language design. They knew what they were doing. Mm. Okay. Um, I think Tom Love said that it was his idea to use uh, square brackets in Objective C, and for for the language to have sort of this the two levels the the object oriented small talk level and then the C procedural level is that correct? I'm not attached to to who claims the idea. <laughs> okay. I I know most most of the characters in in I know how. I chose specific characters, for, oh. and that was to try characters like the square bracket mm -hmm. and see if Yak complained. Oh, okay. So, um, it wasn't because um, it was used for blocks and small talk that you saw a similarity there. I that I may have noticed a similarity, but literally the reason is what what. What can be parsed? Right. What didn't conflict with C? Right. Right. Um, how so? How much? How much? Uh, what was Tom's contribution to? The well, he was building the company and the, doing the consulting. Okay. Largely. I, I was doing the language. Okay. It was pretty cleanly split around that. Right. Okay. Um, and you were developing the language on a 512K Mac, Macintosh? <laughs> uh, no. Oh, no. Okay. That's not correct. <laughs> I, I think that refers to Tom's first Macintosh. Oh, okay. Um, the... I did most of the development on a Fortune... A computer called Fortune. Uh -huh. It was the first desktop Linux, Unix. Oh, desktop that, Unix. That um, that I know of, huh. except for that um, machine I referred to as the size of a coffee table. It was little. Okay. So it was a workstation. Onyx. Onyx. So the first was an Onyx. Then a few years later came this Fortune uh -huh. desktop um, system. Little floppy drives for disks was all it had. You know, pretty primitive, but but that's what I used. Hmm. Okay. Um, so was was the was Objective C at this point? I guess you mentioned there were two there were two stages. Um, at what point was it a full compiler, um, or what was at was it like a macro preprocessor at some point where that just compiled into C, and then and then compile like you compile the C back in, into whatever native. I, I would machine. characterize it as a process of 
steady improvement. Okay. But the time it was, the, it became clearly a compiler with no apologies was when we got investment and brought in a um, um, programming staff. Oh. And um, they did a careful design of the thing. And probably half a dozen versions getting to that point. Okay. But um, I'll, you know, just getting better, but not not perfect. Right. Okay. So, so it could have been in that in intermediate stage. It could have been a macro preprocessor. Um, I no, not a macro preprocessor. Um, um, par parsing those message expressions would take more than a macro oh, okay. can do. Okay. Um, but simpler. It's a, a simple approach was right. where we started and got better over time. Right. Okay. Um, so the so you mentioned. Um, Let's let's talk about when you started to get um, venture funding. Um, what what was uh, the trigger for for that? Uh, the trigger. Or at what point did 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 you and Tom realize that you needed to get external? Uh, well, funding? we um, I think from day one we we knew that was part of the plan. Oh, okay. Um, and so in parallel with that consulting contract and development of the compiler, mm -hmm. we contacted venture capital firms mm -hmm. and it eventually culminated in, excuse me, culminated in um, investment. Okay. I it think what they saw in the company, company was not I think what attracted them was this idea of component truth. Mm -hmm. um, they were pretty clearly not inter interested in supporting pure language development. Um, they had some history with doing language mm -hmm. funding, um, but they liked the idea of components. Hmm. And so that was the reason, so, so it was at that point that you started to hire um, people with, uh, with experience designing programming languages. Mm -hmm. okay. um, was that around the time that you hired Steve Neroff? Yeah, he was one of those. Okay. Um, what was it about Steve Neroff in particular that, tracked, that thought you thought he was a good person for the job. I don't know. I just, I just like the guy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't recall any in particular. Mm -hmm. Was it his ex previous experience? Well, he, he had some experience with sale that seemed, uh, right. seemed relevant. Um, mm. Okay. Um, let's see. So the company was uh, was in Sandy Hook. Yeah. Or what? Was it originally in Sandy Hook, or where did you move to Sandy Hook? We moved. Um, before that, it was nearby, but you uh, know, old dentist office. You know, oh. startup quarters. I think it was in the same town, but um, I honestly don't remember for sure. Okay, and then the new the new location after you expanded was in a an old waterfall driven factory. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> it's a beautiful place. Yeah, did that have anything to do with um, the the colonial era metaphors that you were using? Not really. But I, I'd taken to, um, I don't, uh, 
I was very taken by the idea of interchangeable parts in musket manufacturing because mm -hmm. that seemed to uh, express this component component mm -hmm. idea very, very well. But I don't think that connected with the um, uh, Sandy Hook factory. Okay. Um, wait, what was it about colonial era gun manufacture in particular? Was it uh, was it, I mean, that's a very interesting histor particular historical moment. Um, what, why did that speak to you so much? Well, the idea of a gun part, like a trigger that can be taken out of this gun and put in a hundred others and work just as well, interchangeable parts, mm -hmm. seemed to be the birth of the componentry idea. And, uh, something that could be applied to software pretty straightforwardly. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, you know, it's hard, it's hard to reconstruct why, why you're drawing the particular analogies in retrospect. Mm -hmm. They just sort of click on you and you, you, uh, you build on them. Mm -hmm. But I was trying to get across this idea of, pro, of pro, ways to, to be more productive. Because mm -hmm. it never seemed to me that language alone would make much difference. Mm -hmm. Switching from C to A to mm -hmm. would be nothing. Mm -hmm. From C to C++, it seemed to me to only have marginal changes, marginal improvements. Mm -hmm. So what could bring major improvements, components? Right. Um, meaning revolutionary improvement. Yeah. Right. Um, all right, we're back. Um, that was uh, actually very interesting, the story that your wife told. Um, <laughs> why don't we talk about how you met your wife and, and uh, yeah, Oh, sure. Uh, well, this goes even further back um, to University of Chicago days. At the time, I was um, very much into bluegrass playing, <laughs> guitar playing. And um, uh, Bill Monroe was the father of bluegrass, He's, uh, had a farm in Illinois, I think it was, and he held a convention every year, a bluegrass convention. So I went down there to um, um, well, m m mainly to, go, to pick, pick guitar around the campfire with with the um, people who were paid to be there, mm -hmm. but um, and also to to watch the performances. And she was there, um, oh gosh, she was there with, alone or with someone, I don't, that part I don't remember, but anyway, she had this little Yorkshire Terrier that um, attracted my attention and <laughs> one thing led to another from there. <laughs> <laughs> and when were you married? Oh, uh, just about the time I left. Oh, uh, the time I left Chicago. Oh, oh, Chicago. Right. So that was, uh, let's see, what year was that? Oh, you'd have to drive it. It would have been in the 70s sometime. 70s. <laughs> yeah. And, I mean, she just mentioned that um, she decided to get a degree in, in uh, is it management information science, MIS? Well, she, she has several degrees, master's degrees. Um, so your wife mentioned that uh, uh, Apple gave you some computers? I'm, I'm going to seem really out of touch here, but that I don't recall. Uh -huh. I don't recall actually having Apple or Next computers on hand except Tom's Macintosh that he was doing small talk on. Hmm. 
that must have been done after the sale of Objective-C rights to, to Apple. Oh, okay. That's, <clears throat> that's the only way that makes sense technically is we transferred the rights to Apple so and like they post, finished the development. Post-1997. Right. I see. Okay. Let's, um, well, let's, let's back up and talk about how did um, your company um, get involved with Next and Steve Jobs. Okay. Um, remember, I, I was head down, heads down working on uh, component development at the time and, and only indirectly involved in the actual negotiations, but as my memory um, from, from memory, there were two main candidates for an object-oriented language for for next, Object Pascal and Objective C, mm -hmm. um, and they both had um, um, big supportive factions. But um, within next, yeah. But Objective C turned out to have the advantage in that its base was available on everywhere. It was more ubiquitous. Pascal was harder to find. Mm -hmm. um, and so it kind of back and forth over an extended period of time, but um, eventually they settled on Objective C. I see. I think Steve um, talked about some of the reasons in that paper we were looking at earlier. Steve Neroff, you mean? Yeah. Okay. Um, and of course, much of, much of the details there weren't visible to us. We were, you know, cotton on the way. Um, mm -hmm. But that's what I picked up over time. I see. Um, but they could have chosen C++ if they wanted to see ways. Why didn't they go with the oh, C++? For, um, it is totally un, uh, un what they wanted. Uh-huh. Remember that soldering iron analogy? That, right. that ideal is actually how s Apple's... Um, or next business model has developed. They basically take write software components to do things like scroll bar, for example, mm -hmm. provide it with a soldering iron right. to their end users, and their end users glue these components together to build um, iPhone applications. Right. So it's, it's directly um, software IC based. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> The only uh, difficult, the only dichotomy there is that we originally, PPI originally saw ourselves as components builders, mm -hmm. and Apple saw themselves as in that role. Okay. So that's there where, was a conflict of interest. Right. Right. Okay. Um, so you didn't have any direct that. How much contact did you have with Steve Jobs? Very little. Very little. Um, Met him at a conference once, but okay. that, that was the extent of my involvement. I was really pretty heads down on components. On components. That whole period. Right. Um, well, let's go back and talk about that. So, you know, so um, at this point in time, well, so actually, let's go back even further. What, why, did, why did the company's name change to Stepstone after you got venture capital funding? Uh, the venture capitalist wanted <laughs> I don't. I never understood why they didn't like PPI, but they, they wanted a name change. Okay. And so, where did the name Stepstone come from? Oh, like everything else, it was coined. Uh, the idea of stepping stone. By yourself, so. or by Tom, or by one of the VCs. Oh, we probably had the typical naming contest internally. <laughs> you know, not nothing very entertaining to talk about. Just a name, a name that seemed to fit. I see. So the idea of stepping productivity again, right. step stone to, to productivity. Stepping stone to productivity. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so you mentioned that your focus shifted from the language to uh, the libraries, um, but it seemed like at this point, 
uh, you sort of gave Steve Naroff full run of the language. Um, well, um, while he was at Stepstone, uh, he was part of the language development team. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, they, they were responsible for the language from that point on. Uh, the library uh, initial development, that was what I was doing. Okay. Um, we were talking about the, uh, the language work, um, the interpreter, the garbage collector. Um, so you mentioned that that was going on in parallel with the libraries. Right. So it was a continual pull from all kind of directions, from sales, uh, from customers, from marketing. To add this feature of that from 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 all directions, mm -hmm. um, garbage collection was one of the big ones. Uh, small talk blocks mm -hmm. was another um, was certainly something I was very interested in and worked on very hard, mm -hmm. and the interpreter was um, an ev even more complicated issue. Because mm -hmm. compared to C, an interpreter is huge. It's mm -hmm. a huge development effort. One of our customers um, built one, um, built an interpreter, a very poorly structured, in my, in my opinion, unmaintainable thing. But, um, so working on the interpreter was basically turning that into something we could call a product, mm -hmm. which is a huge project because of its size. Mm -hmm. And I was never very happy with the result. It, it could do little things okay, but anything more than a couple of lines, you know, wheels started falling off pretty quick. <laughs> <laughs> So, none of, so those three um, blocks, the interpreter, the garbage collector, how, um, how far did, you, did the company get in, in pursuing these, those features? Were they ever shipped? Yeah, I think the blocks was the one that was most feasible. Mm -hmm. The other two were frankly unfeasible in my opinion, but there was a huge demand for them. But Blocks was eventually turned into something called ICPAC 201, which um, so it was, was the, in a library. Yeah, which was the foundation for things like um, not just Blocks, but uh, as asynchronous tools, oh. cues, and um, concurrency. Concurrency and. Um, A bunch of user interface stuff was in there. Have any more of those interruptions? All right, are we, are we good? All right. Um, so you mentioned that uh, the company's strategy at this point in time was on the software IC packs, the libraries, and that caused a conflict of interest with one of your customers, Next, which was also building their own libraries. Um, was, th was that business uh, decision coming from the venture capitalists that had invested in the company or? Well, I, I wouldn't, I think calling it a conflict of interest is um, overstating it. It's just a difference in point of view. Mm -hmm. um, the investors um, liked the components approach and supported it. And um, I don't know that Apple thought of themselves as being in the components business. I, they don't, didn't articulate things that way, but that may be my view of what business they were actually in. I've oh, always thought of Apple as being uh, the... Um, Brad's way of thinking about Apple was as a, a software components company. Okay. 
I'm not I'm not next. sure if they would agree with that or not. Right. But. I mean, next was a software components company. Kind of next, and then yeah. Apple. And then Apple, right? Yeah. Um, I think to some extent that's that's accurate. Um, I in a in, I I did an interview with Steve Neroff, and he said that um, Steve Jobs had had there was a meeting. There was a meeting with um, between Steve Neroff, Tom Love, uh, on the Stepstone side, and and Steve Jobs and Bud Tribble on the next side, where Jobs told Tom to stop focusing on the IC packs and make Objective C the language great because he didn't think that he thought that Next's own libraries were better than your libraries mm -hmm. were. What did you think? Of, were you were you were aware of this? Not at the time. I mean, I I, I only when uh, Steve and I worked on that paper. Mm -hmm. That's the first time I heard of that. But mm -hmm. again, I was not in that meeting. Right. Would you disagree with that statement? No, not at all. Because um, the. The thing I've never managed to successfully do was to find a business model for these components. Uh -huh. I mean, they're made of bits. They, they can be copied in nanoseconds. Right. So um, you can't buy and sell them like a can of sardines. Mm -hmm. But Apple could because they could nail these software things down to a tangible piece of hardware and, and build a business on around right. that so um, you know and time proved them right 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 I will get to that later um, but I wanted to go back and ask um, so you mentioned that um, objective C's object oriented layer was dynamically typed and only had static typing at the procedural C layer. Um, and Neroff started to add some static typing in the higher layers. Mm -hmm. um, was, was, that, was that a good thing in your mind, or did, you, did that take away from what your initial vision was for the language? Mm. I always thought of it as just um, improvements. Mm -hmm. You know, I was glad to have uh, about anything that improved on what C provided was an improvement. Mm -hmm. It's not where I'd have spent my own time, but uh, it's, Steve had his own ideas about where to make improvements, and I, I didn't really disagree. Mm. What do you think of uh, sort of these constant debates between? static and dynamic typing and binding? I've, uh, since, since those times, I've, I've largely, almost, I've entirely switched over to Java because of, um, and I've grown to really appreciate this kind of static typing that, that it provides. Mm -hmm. um, the C++ approach always struck me as toxic for sharing all these header files and um, um, oh what's the term for it uh, it, it just, just seemed like not a move toward a more productive language in, in most respects but Java did it had garbage collection it had uh, uh, very supportive IDEs um, um, it was you know, a breath of fresh air. So I've gone, I've gone to Java and, and never looked back. Mm, okay. Um, I've forgotten the question. Oh, <laughs> but it's, so it's not, I mean, you, you're, you're sort of agnostic in between static and static and dynamic typing or static and dynamic binding. I mean, Java has static typing but dynamic binding. Well, when, it, when static does the job, it's a tool to use, but it doesn't do all jobs. So, um, if you can ch check her as early at compile time, uh, why not? Mm -hmm. Right. 
Um, you mentioned in your, your interview for the book Masters of Programming that if you had to start over again, you would remove inheritance from Objective-C because it's not that important. Why well, that's, that's an overstatement, but, um, <laughs> but not far from the tr truth. At, at one time, I thought it was important, mainly because Smalltalk had it, and, if, and I was, my goal at that time was to simply duplicate as much of Smalltalk as I could. Um, but since then, I've uh, almost never used it anymore. Mm -hmm. um, What's the problem with inheritance? <clears throat> it's it, it's really. <coughs> I did all kind of experiments uh, trying to find the proper use, the right way to use inheritance, and, and none of them really, really very satisfactory. Because anything you put in the superclass, everything inherits it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and there's no way to control it. Plus, it, encapsulation can be used, I forget the name of the, the guy who uh, wrote a whole paper about this, but um, basically showed how everything you can do with inheritance, you can do with encapsulation. Hmm. Um, and then there was a small talk derivative, I think called, what it called, squeak? Squeak or self or squeak, yeah. Uh, self, was, self. yes. Um, Prototype based language. Yeah, that basically did without inheritance altogether. and. Um, it eventually, eventually won me over. Mm -hmm. I tried really hard to find a way to use inheritance correctly, but um, I eventually just quit. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's go back to talking about the, the Next contract. Um, what did you think of the things that Next wanted to change in, in the Objective-C language? Um, at that time, my focus was totally on components, right? Not, not on language. I I don't recall having a firm opinion. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, were was there? Were you upset when Naroff decided to join next and leave Stepstone? Probably. Um, probably. I, I don't remember any great okay. angst. <laughs> <laughs> um, did the next version of Objective C um, basically fork from the Stepstone version? Were there essentially two different versions of the language? Well, there, there was a period of transition, but the outcome of the transition was that Apple fully acquired rights right. to Objective-C, and um, so there, there was no Stepstone Objective-C work after that. Okay. Um, that happened in, what, 95, 1995 or so? Plausibly. Okay. Well, how did that, how did that sale occur? I mean, was it, uh, was it, was it, how, I mean, how, was it because of Stepstone's other financial difficulties or why did, why did uh, Stepstone decide to sell the rights of the language to, to Next? Um, I've, I've never heard, uh, anyone answer that question directly. Hmm. So uh, probably it was just no other option by that time. Hmm. Um, sorry, I can't be more specific. Okay. Um, was Stepstone ever involved in uh, getting Objective-C into the uh, GCC compiler? No. No, okay.
Um, Neroff also mentioned that uh, Hewlett Packard also was a, a, object, a client that wanted to use Objective C. Mm -hmm. um, what did they use it for? Um, research. Um, a, as their research language, they're big supporters of it. Mm -hmm. So it was just in, inside the HP labs? Yeah. So it never made it into any products? Not to my knowledge. Okay. It's not to say I would have knowledge of that. It's just I, I don't know. Right. Okay. Um, let's go back to the uh, your work on the IC packs. Um, so I think you've you've written that your focus on the IC packs was using it for uh, GUI library, graphical user interface libraries. That's one of two products. We oh, had. okay. First product was the foundational classes, the kind of thing that you immediately associate with Java, you know, sets and strings and, mm -hmm. you know, the low-level low libraries. The other IC pack was the kind of things you get from Java with Spring. With, uh, swing. Swing. Yeah. The, the GUI. The GUI components. classes. Um, so those, those were the two IC pack products mm -hmm. um, at, at the time. Seemed like there were more, but um, maybe maybe I'm confusing the IC pack work with the interpreter and oh, uh, there there were a lot of projects going on in in all three spaces, so it's the boundaries between them were off, often a little sloppy. Right. I mean, you mentioned that the the blocks stuff ended up going into an IC pack that was later on used for um, threading and concurrencies type stuff. Right. I, I think that was I th that was probably the the next release oh, okay. that never never shipped. Never shipped. Um, but you did ship the uh, the GUI the, the GUI. Yeah the first two libraries first two did libraries. ship and this was this was the uh, futuristic thing that never made it. Right. And why, um, why focus on the, the GUI part of it? Um, uh, because uh, without, without that, that would seem to be the big answer to productivity, programmer productivity, was uh, something like Smalltalk user interface, just mm -hmm. made total sense at the time. I'm not sure I believe it now, but, uh, mm -hmm. but at the time, it, seemed very plausible. Right. Um, I think you, you wrote in that paper, actually, that the focus on the graphics libraries ended up bogging the company down because you had to try to make it work on every individual platform. Well, it was a, it was a heavy weight to haul around. The, the language itself could be ported in, in hours. Mm -hmm. But... Um, this graphic library was very heavyweight to port. Mm -hmm. Now, whether that drags the company down, I'm, I'm not sure I'd go that far because it was also very attractive in those days. Right. So it was a big selling point. It's right. just expensive. It's all daylight to do it. So it was a big expense for the company, but it was also generating a lot of revenue for the company. Mm -hmm. right. How much of the so, so was most of the company's revenue derived from selling the IC packs? Or I, the IC I don't packs? remember the split um, between language sales and the two library sales. Oh, okay, but it was both. It was it was either one or the other. Right, as I recall, the IC pack one on one was bundled with the compiler. Oh, as right. I recall. The, the user interface library was separate. Right. And I don't remember the split between them. Okay. But, it, but if you added them together, they would be 100%? Or did you still have contracting revenues? There was occasional contracting revenue. Nothing as big as the Phillips contract. Okay. How did... Um, let's talk about... 
the um, sort of what what do you think the reasons why Stepstone di didn't succeed in the end? Well, remember, um, this was so early that there were no answers to how nobody knew how the world was going to unfold back then. Mm -hmm. So you're making your best guesses and you're placing your bets. Mm -hmm. At the time, and throughout throughout the history, our focus was on programmer productivity. Right. I never imagined that that this open source movement would come along, right. where programmers are essentially free. Right. Um, I couldn't have predicted the world would unfold in that way. Right. And still don't fully understand how it. Uh, you know what sports the sky hook <laughs> <laughs> but so be it that's, that's how things transpired and um, right so essentially the whole business model was obsoleted by open source because some people could create libraries for free and your business model is based on selling them well, that's the claim anyway that they can create libraries for free. I don't buy the claim because somebody, I mean, they have to support themselves somehow. Right. It's just I don't fully understand how they do. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Seems like black magic. Yeah. Well, let's uh, let's go back to um, the publication of uh, one one your book, but also the the, the two articles that you're famous for. Well, one was the IEEE software engineering article, uh, software software revolution article, and then the other one was the uh, the 1991 Byte magazine article. No, um, there is a silver bullet. Which, oh yeah. Um, can you talk about how how the, how you came to publish those? We're trying to articulate what we were just talking about. Um, right. This view that. Um, that there could be a component market. Mm -hmm. I, I repeat again, so little was known back then about how the future was going to unfold. Uh, like, evil people hadn't been invented yet. <laughs> I mean, we were building email systems that uh, where you can forge the sender address. Mm -hmm. I mean, that that's what email is to this day. Um, so much hadn't been invented yet. Um, and I was very eager to define, to help push for a future in which people could earn a living bu building components. Mm -hmm. And so both of those articles were trying to articulate that, hey guys, we could go this way. The future could look like this. Yeah. Um, and not a future that was supported by advertising and malware. <laughs> right. Which is what industry effectively chose. Right. So I, I gave it my best shot, but um, I, I don't feel like a, it was anywhere near successful. Uh -huh. But it was, uh, I mean, pretty provocative that, I mean, your, the title of your Byte Magazine article is an explicit rebuttal of one of Fred Brooks's well-known Articles like so mm -hmm. bullet. They could. I. I, I think. Um, yeah, I stand by that. It was. It was very deliberate. Yeah. Yeah. And I always. I, I never viewed it as a challenge, to Fred Brooks. I. I viewed it as um, built st standing on his shoulders. He articulated mm -hmm. that. That thing, but hey, we can polish these edges and get even closer to where he's trying to get to. Right. Because um, that idea of, of off-the-shelf components could be the silver bullet mm -hmm. for uh, software productivity if only we could find a business model for, for selling them. And right. So I then focused on the if-only part of that, right. that clause. Um, you, you explicitly uh, talk about um, Thomas Kuhn and 
um, his book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions and the Notion of Paradigm Shift. Um, where did you come across that and why did you, why, why was it useful to you to, to cite him? Oh gosh, I don't remember the context now. Do you recall? Um, the, you sort of use it to sort of say, um, just like similarly, like when, you know, the Copernican revolution um, and the industrial revolution components, software components are sort of the software industrial yeah. revolution and this is like a Kuhnian paradigm shift and you likened it to that I'm sorry I'm, I'm not um, I'm not remembering it struck anything. me because uh, most computer science type articles don't draw on history of science <laughs> <laughs> well <laughs> Exactly. Or history in particular. I mean, you, you, the, you know, the colonial... Well, that's, that's the thing that sent me down this, this components trail so strongly because uh, how do you have a science when every component you meet is the first time you encounter it? Mm -hmm. there's, no, there's no reusability like steel. You saw steel last week, so you know what steel is this week. Mm -hmm. There are no bricks. There are no, there's no... Um, so how do you have a science where everything is, is new every time you see it? Mm -hmm. Answer is you don't. I mean, so I say there's no right. such thing as computer science or software engineering. Right. I've taken to using the analogy of mud masonry. Right. Um, so, um, so I don't know if Kuhn uh, is useful in illustrating that point or not, but uh, <laughs> I must have used him for some reason. At the time, it was a, yeah, you, you seemed to have liked using. You thought it was a good idea. Yeah. Okay. Um, so then, I mean, it struck me that, um, you know, we, you mentioned the business model, right? The, the business model. So um, the, that your sort of your idea for the market for components requires well a market um, how important is it for the market to be part of the solution because it's not a traditional computer science thing to think of that's usually think of a lot of as economics right why is the market so important because where else are you going to get components um, well open source well look at the components you get from open source mm -hmm. and um, that doesn't speak the components I know about from open source don't reek of quality mm -hmm. and don't reek of, of, of reuse it sort of epitomized what I was trying to avoid because to me a component is something that people obsess about for generations you know pour all of their energy into that particular component is there what they hope to sell on the market. Very high quality. Right. Um, and open source doesn't, doesn't create the incentives well, to do I'm that. I'm generally disappointed with what I get. And I spend my, all of my time doing using um, Spark for big data calculations, right? Uh -huh. And Spark is, uh, it's the best idea going, but boy, it's messy. Right. And um, it's hard to hold that in a, as an example of what you could aspire to. Right. But isn't the idea of open source that if you don't like it, you can go and fix it yourself rather than... Sure. You're free to do, fix it yourself. <laughs> but uh, it's like if you're building a house, you're free to dig mud and clay in the backyard and build a house. I mean, so... But it's not good for mass producing houses. Right. right, or or I would say even for houses in general, you generally get better quality if you take this other approach where you buy components from uh, from people that make make their career around providing components. Right, right. Um, there was actually um, there were actually a few companies um, in the in the next step 
space um, on the next platform that did actually uh, to try to sell component libraries. Um, but uh, a lot of them did take off because either the objects were either too specialized um, or they weren't well tested enough or they weren't well, weren't well documented enough. Um, were you aware of, no, I wasn't. of this? No, I wasn't. Yeah. They were called Objectware. No. Um, there were a couple companies that were trying to sell them. And I don't think they ever succeeded that well. Yeah, I'm not surprised. But <laughs> <laughs> it turned out to be a very hard thing to do because, again, how, how do you, how do you, what replaces scarcity? Mm -hmm. You've got a component that can be copied in nanoseconds. What do you do to, to charge for it? Right. Well, that's a that's a good segue to um, the book, the, your later book that you wrote, Super Distribution. Um, so that that book describes sort of this idea where you're moving away from selling the components to to metering their usage. Mm -hmm. um, where did where was that idea from? Did you get that idea from Japan? Where did that idea come from? Well, uh, I got the name from Japan. Okay, there was a, a paper by that name, Super Distribution. Um, the idea seems to be ori original. I remember uh, a conversation with um, um, Oh, Dan, don't do that, brain. Ken. Ken Hammerhodge is in my oh. office. Mm -hmm. Where I was trying to articulate what makes software ICs diff di so different from hardware ICs. Mm -hmm. And uh, that seems to be the start of the idea of, of um, they are fundamentally different things in opposite universes. Right. You know, one abides by conservation of mass and the other doesn't. So they're they're more different than somewhere. And, and so how do you yeah. charge for something so different? Right. So by the use was a, came out of that conversation. The only problem was uh, that was the wrong level of granularity to attempt it. Mm -hmm. Apple eventually found an answer to that question of how to charge for it. You nail it to hardware and sell the hardware. Uh -huh. And then in years since, SOA came along. Uh, SOA, so, yeah, service uh, oriented service architecture. Now, now cloud, where the answer is build your components over yonder on that server and and charge for the use. Okay. Don't don't let co don't ship copies. Just right. run it only there. So the, the, that's two workable answers to the question I posed of how to charge for this stuff. Right. Super distribution was a third attempt to answer it, but the granularity was all wrong. Right, because you were still trying to, to do it at the, at the granularity level of the object components, right. the, same, the same level that, that the software ICs were, were yep. uh, getting at, which was the sort of the, I mean, you called it what, the chip or gate level? That, that was right. the metaphor that you yeah. used, the, the chip and gates, whereas yep. you, the ideal granularity is at the what the rack or the the card level or. Oh, well, I would never say that it is an I. I would never claim an ideal level. It's right. just um, those are three. Those are what was it? Five levels that the hardware engineer and community found finds essential right. for diff different tools for different jobs. Right. And and so articulating components, uh, software components using the metaphor of, of hardware at the time made a lot of sense to outline these sort of granularities. Um, but where the metaphor breaks down is that software can be copied infinitely and has no material scarcity. All right. And so you have to find some other mechanism to, to charge, to for, charge it. for it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so you left Stepstone in, uh, what is it, 1990, after Tom Love? Oh, yeah, after after Tom, but the, uh, don't pin me down on dates. Okay. I, my, I, just, I don't retain them. 
Okay. Um, so wait, Tom left because he had a disagreement with the board and the new CEO right. appointed. Uh, and I, I don't remember exactly what about. Oh, okay. Um, I, I wasn't in on those conversations, so mm -hmm. um, I can't shed much light. You'll have to ask him. Okay. But uh, once again, after he left, you didn't see much reason for you to stay. Um, or it seemed like I was. I did stay for for an extended period, but I. Um, well, I, I stayed until the company closed. Oh, okay. Basically, um, right. Which must have been like maybe maybe as long as a year. Oh, okay. How? So how how tough was that period for you? Well, sales wise, it was terrible. <laughs> um, but again, my job in those in those at that time was um, uh, re the research arm of the company, mm -hmm. building future products. And I kept trudging away on that goal. Mm -hmm. Did the was it because the market for the for the components suddenly evaporated? Because you were making decent revenue before. Um, I don't know. I wouldn't call it suddenly evaporated. It's just it had been a, a hard haul all along. Oh, okay. Um, and one I wasn't directly involved in, so I, I don't have much to add to it. Okay. Um, so what did you do after you left Stepstone? Um, I worked on the second book for... Okay. The Super Distribution book? Yeah, for quite a while. And then um, I joined George Mason. To Universe, okay. Is that when you moved from Connecticut to mm -hmm. the yeah. D.C. area? Right. Um, why did you decide to go back to academia? Um, I don't know. They they call me. Um, this was a spinoff from the economics department there. Huh. Um, it's called. Um, Program on Social and Organizational Learning, PSOL, uh, P-S-O-L. Right. And this was basically the um, group that was, economics group that was trying to articulate why capitalism is better than communism. Okay. I'm oversimplifying grossly here, <laughs> but, uh, and they, they saw my efforts in bringing software into the capitalism approach right. as being um, what they were trying to achieve more right. broadly. So they, that's why they brought me in. Okay. They saw some synergy there. That makes a lot of sense. And, um, they also um, liked the idea that I was a software developer. Uh, and that George Mason was interested in building a way to to make revenue out of software de development. Oh yeah, that's that's true. Huh? So like, because I know that they have um, they have a group there that um, makes software for the digital humanities and for uh, for history in particular. Um, were were you involved in that at all, or? I, I know the guy who was um, building CDs of his, for history. Uh -huh. The revenue angle I, I hadn't turned up before. Oh, like CD ROMs. Well, yeah, the idea that you can make money doing that hadn't been oh, okay. hadn't come up in my experience. But in what context did you hear about it? In a money money context or no? no from a, an academic context, yeah. actually. Um, mm -hmm. They, they have a program where they have graduate students doing research, developing software for 
humanities professors and history professors to do their own work. So they, one of the you know, products that come out of it is a, a, a program called Zotero, which, um, which is like a digital reference, a digital library. Uh, you can use it to manage your citations. It's a mm -hmm. citation manager, mm -hmm. and you can use it to automatically um, reformat all of your citations using a different, you know, from uh, Chicago style to NLA or or whatever. Just mm -hmm. add it you know, with a press of a button. Um, that that well, that that product is also open source, so it's not it's not a product for sale. But um, yeah, but they make these tools and. Um, yeah, so I, I came from Neuro for, for, for that reason. Um, so wait, uh, you've said that you view computer science as more, more of a social science than a physical science. Is that, that true? I think it would be more accurate to say it's not a science. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, then what is it? <laughs> it's not a science. Um, is it an art? It is, a, is it engineering? Is it mathematics? It's certainly not engineering. It's <laughs> certainly not mathematics. Maybe an art would be, a craft would be a, craft. a better term for it. But even a craft, there's reusability of, of know-how across materials. Mm -hmm. You know, leather today is leather yesterday. Mm -hmm. Um, we don't have that. Mm -hmm. um, when you were at George Mason, did you read a lot of um, political economy, Adam Smith, Karl Marx? Um, well, it was, uh, all of that was very much in the air. Right. Um, my focus at George Mason very quickly turned to the internet, uh. and. Um, when I, when I joined, all that there was was Gopher. Right. And very quickly, um, the, um, the web, the web um, became known, and I, I jumped on top of that with both feet. Mm -hmm. The whole idea was how can I use internet to support teaching. Okay. Um, and... Um, so was that, were you working on that the whole time you were at George Mason? Pretty much. Pretty much. Yeah. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the really interesting papers on your website that I ran across was um, you have a, a page uh, called Social Construction of Reality. Mm -hmm. um, where did that come from? That was um, PSOL. That was... Um, PSOL? The, the department now, oh, yeah, Program on Social okay. and Organizational Learning. That's, right. that's all about social construction of reality. And, um, there, oh, so that program was very into, into that. Right. So it's more like, that. the page is more like a syllabus? Is that, because it lists a whole bunch I, of different references. Yeah. I, I honestly don't remember the page very well. I, okay. I know you're right. I know it's there. It's just I don't, I don't know what I poured into that. Okay. Um, sorry. Okay. Um, what did you think of the idea of social construction of reality? Initially, um, I came from a much harder, harder edge view of the world where um, reality is what reality is and um, the only way to view it is through the scientist's lens. Right. But I eventually got, uh, came around to view social construction as being, you know, a better view of, of the world. Mm. Um, uh, why is that? It starts with with that claim before that science is is the better view. Is, science is a stronger view, the um, objectivist view of the of the world. Then you then you realize what is science, if not uh, 
um, a construct of a community. Right. So, um, and then and then you go on from that and realize there's nothing other than than community mm -hmm. is creating your understanding of the universe. Right. Did you get that from reading Thomas Kuhn, or? No, not, certainly not Kuhn, but uh, he was a part of it. Um, who are the main authors there? Um, I'm articulating arguments that came from other people in that department more than things oh, that I, okay. that I um, was personally invested in, but... Um, um, Did you read uh, Peter Berger and Thomas Luckman's book, *The Social Construction of Reality*? No, I never read it directly. Okay, <laughs> but you're aware. But I guess it was in the air. Um, yeah. What about the literature in um, sociology of scientific knowledge, or the social construction of technology, or yeah. science, technology, and society? Those fields. Yeah, certainly. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, disclaimer: My PhD happens to be in science and technology studies ah. and my dissertation advisor is Trevor Pinch who is one of the founders of social construction of technology so that's <laughs> where my interest is coming for, from I see <laughs> trying to I see. you know <laughs> yeah I wish I wish I could say I have a greater depth of knowledge about that than I actually do mm -hmm. this, this was more the sea I swam in than something that I contributed to. Right. But the ideas were, were uh, you were open to the ideas and they were uh, attractive to you. Yeah, reluctantly open. It, right. It, it took some time to um, come around. Right. Was that, was that difficult? Well, it took some time. Um, that probably means it was difficult, but... Uh, uh, but I came around. Okay. <laughs> Um, was, did you, sort of, how much did you grapple with sort of the, maybe the relativistic or postmodernist sort of ideas um, in some of these sort of constructivist views? Because, I mean, well, I know it coming... Was, it was very much the environment that I was in. Again, what I grappled with was how to do teaching over the internet. Oh, okay. That was where, where my personal energy was. But um, this whole idea of social construction and postmodern approach was very much the environment that uh, you know every day I had to deal with. Right, I see. I just I just wasn't expected to contribute to it. Right. So, um, what sorts of things did you produce um, in terms of uh, teaching over the internet at George Mason? Well, uh, as It all started with this, with this whole view of why are all of you, why are all of you, speaking to students, sitting in this room? Mm -hmm. Is this really serving your needs? Uh. Um, why do we? Parking was always a huge hassle. Why do we put up with all that hassle? Um, why do we take time off from work to come to this particular room when this new thing called the internet is claiming to be able to reach out and deliver education to people where they live? Mm -hmm. It all started from that line of questioning. Mm -hmm. um, as soon as um, we had something better than Gopher, um, the early browsers, uh, I began to see a way to actually deliver education at, at a distance, long distance, mm -hmm. overseas, and interstate, and um, just became very energized with with uh, pushing that to the limit. Mm -hmm. The um, where I ended up with was. Um, 
a pearl-based environment that would basically lead a student from from nothing to being able to build websites, which was what the goal I, I set for the course. Um, without much ability to stray. Mm -hmm. They didn't have much ability to, to not do the work, to skip the work, because right. this Pearl program was constantly keeping them on the straight and narrow okay. path. Mm -hmm. So that um, most, I felt like I could guarantee learning that way. Right. And uh, um, the results pretty much proved it. I could pretty much guarantee anybody who kept up with the demands of those Pearl scripts would get an A. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so it seemed very successful, except in the sense it was too expensive. Uh -huh. uh, the load I was carrying, supporting all of that, code, writing all that code to support that was um, not sustainable in the long run. I see. So you were teaching, you were using that course to teach web programming or mm -hmm. like web, creating a website? Yeah, the technical term for it was teach, building a website. Mm -hmm. What I was really after was how to teach quality websites. Okay. How to appreciate quality and and um, deliver. Right. You know, beyond the what was really required. Right. Um, would that approach have worked for other subjects like physics or history or? I don't see why not. Right. Would it? Would it have? Would it have taught a sort of very narrow subset of the material, or I mean, because you said it limited Sub subject, exploration. Not, no subject to the workload requirement of writing uh, and debugging a whole Perl program every week. Ah, oh, okay. Right. Um, I, I don't feel stable. like it. It it scales in the sense that there's no twenty-person limit on what a. Pro pro one professor can do. I mean, I, I, there were semesters I was carrying like a hundred students internationally, because yeah. um, these Pearl programs could do most of the work. Yeah. But to scale it across the faculty for for a whole uh, curriculum, I'm not sure that's that's doable. Right, I see. But it sure worked well for what I was doing. <laughs> Did, did that work? Um, was that an early version of what we have now have called um, MOOCs, Massively Online, these Massively Online courses? That was very much coming into fashion at that time, but it's not exactly new. Um, the whole idea was to create this tight interactive loop between, using Perl to create this loop between the student, me, and other students. Okay. And... Um, these programs would do things like create collaborative tasks that had to be done in in collaboration with other people on their team, um, and manage that collaboration. So <laughs> so you couldn't have shirkers. Right. Um, it, you know, very difficult programming, but um, led to a very good learning experience. Right. Because. Um, I remember one of the one of the tasks. Once I taught them the technic technicalities of building websites, one of the tasks beyond that is form up into teams, and as a team, choose a project that makes the world a better place, <laughs> <laughs> and bring back a customer that confirms that um, that you've done that. So people were doing everything. They would automate dog shelters, you know, <laughs> build websites to get dogs adopted. <laughs> One of them built a website for Shell Oil Company. Um, <laughs> all, all over the map. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> that's interesting. <laughs> oh, I don't know how does this Shell Oil Company website make the world a better place. I, that is debatable. That was their challenge. <laughs> they didn't have to explain it to me. <laughs> okay. Um, and so you were teaching this over the web. So how how was like were they running a 
were they running the program in the browser? Like, were they was it were they writing uh, programs in the browser? How how did that work? Were well, the browser supports forms. Okay. So um, when they sign in to do their work, they get a a web page that. Um, isn't just a blank syllabus that tells you generally where things are going to go in the future. It says the, the login page tells them exactly the next step they need to take to succeed in the course hmm. this week. So they click OK and it gives them some information. The form at the end checks their understanding. Hmm. And if they have to interact with other students, we'll hear the uh, links to the other students on your team. Um, here's what they thought about what the team should work on mm -hmm. in f forms. You know, every one of them filled out forms, to, and the form, everyone's form is then filled out by everybody else on the team. So you 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 just use that to uh, lead to lead them down the learning path. Okay. So. Um Let's see, you were at George Mason for how long? Gosh, five. Five years? Five, maybe more. Five, maybe six. Hmm. Um, and uh, why did you decide to, to leave? Um, startup company. Oh, okay. Started um, your own company? or? Yeah. This, this was a super distribution company. That, oh. Um, see if I could... Uh, Make a go of that, right? And and how long were you doing that? Uh, about a year. This was right when the bottom fell out of the internet. Ah, uh, okay. Um, internet boom, and um, it didn't make it. Right. Okay. Um, so then, what did you do after that? Oh, after step stone. After um, super distribution was, I think that's when I got into government consulting. Mm -hmm. Seemed like I may be missing a step, but but um, well, that's pretty close. And what drew you to government consulting? Huh? What what drew you to government consulting? Just that's what's in the area. Oh, because and you're in the Virginia. Yeah. 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 No, not not for any better reason than that. It's just what's available here. Right. Um. So, is it? It seems like it's at this point that you start to sort of think about um, sort of these larger levels of granularity. Um, SOA, uh, service-oriented architecture, and um, and you start using this new metaphor of uh, mud bricks versus <laughs> real bricks. Yeah. Um, so how did that come about? Was it was it work that you were doing for DOD or for other parts of the government? That you know what what led you to sort of think because you hadn't thought of that before. <clears throat> how did you start thinking of it now? Well, I. Um most of, mostly because it was happening now, before it wasn't happening. So it, it took years to um, to mature and mobilize, and even then, um, so I I don't have a better answer to that. It, it just wasn't real until then. I see. So it's sort of this whole idea of. Uh selling services on servers on the cloud that sort of enables this you know the the component the, the component to be to be marketed or to be sold for money now right as a service and not as a I'm giving you the thing yeah making components successful basically mm -hmm. seems to be succeeding on the cloud the th thing I never understood um, is why why SOA went sour. I see. 
I, I never understood that. But what it, happened to it? I think people just got fed up with the uh, complexity of, of doing it, the, of the standards for supporting SOA. But I'm speculating because I don't have a good feeling for um, why people lost, hmm. lost faith in that approach. How, how is that approach different from what people are doing now on the cloud? What they're doing now is so well without the standards. Oh. And that feeling of overbearing, overwhelming complexity of the standards. Okay. So they're just doing it in their own proprietary way? In their own non proprietary. Oh, uh, their own open source way. Yeah. Okay. Rather than have some sort of get together and a committee and decide to create a standard. Mm -hmm. They're just doing their own thing. I think, I think what drove all the standards with SOA was the government. Oh, okay. And that drive just got out of control, I think. But I can't deny that people just don't, totally lost patience with it. Hmm. Wish I had better facts. <laughs> <laughs> is, uh, I mean, is it important, do you think, for to have standards? to have these sorts of international or national standards rather than the open source approach? Well, it's, it's, all I can do is point to the hardware industry where yes, it's very important. Because mm -hmm. that's, that's what makes components work there. Mm -hmm. So now is it important for software? Well, uh, my habit is when I'm looking for insight in software, I look to hardware for for mm -hmm. guidance, so based on that, yes, they're very important. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, this is this um, craft-based enterprise that is prone to inventing its own rules. Mm -hmm. That, um, regardless of any other point in human history, so. You know, I'm, those lessons from the hardware industry don't seem to have as much value to, mm -hmm. other, to other people as they do for me. I see. Because of the, I mean, because of the, the immateriality of software, because it's infinitely copyable? Yeah, and there's, there's nothing to hang on to, like, how the how did steel work last week? Mm -hmm. Can I build a table that uh, shows how to harden it? Right. Mm -hmm. But if that's true about software, if it's so immaterial, why are why do you keep going back to hardware to draw lessons from? If there's a fundamental this difference, this is my nature. <laughs> I, I look for places I feel like I can get insight, and that's where I turn. I see. <laughs> Um, so, you mentioned that the government was involved in trying to standardize SOA. Um, I mean, what's your view of the relationship between the government and the market? Um, it used to be more important than it is now. Uh -huh. I think um, industry is pretty much going its own way regardless of what government thinks. So this is just in terms of like technology standards. Even. Right. The government wants to believe that it had more influence and than it proves to have. But um, I'm I'm speculating. I, I I don't know. Right. And I mean, how much? Uh, do, how much do you feel like? Um, just not in terms of technology, but in terms of the economy, how much involvement do you think the government should have in, in the market? As little as possible. <laughs> <laughs> it's terrible at it. <laughs> so are you more of a libertarian or? I, I suppose so. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you're more of a, like a small government versus big government, uh, small government type? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
um, does that I mean does does that conflict with your the fact that you sometimes you know do that you were doing contracting for the government? I suppose it does. I, um, I'm I'm astonished at, at government's ways of doing things, but um, but also would be very surprised if they can change. <laughs> so. Um, Yeah, there's room for conflict there. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so you see, you see a tension there, but mm -hmm. uh, sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, so you've also talked about um, so Java business integration, uh, software component architecture, and something called OSGI. Uh, so what are what are these things and how are they make how are they making the programming better? Well, let me start with OSGI. Um, that's basically a an attempt to cure the complexity that comes from combining layers of software mm -hmm. from um, that are independently shifting, okay. going, going through their own version changes. Uh, it, it can, you can it can put you into what's called jar hell. Jar hell. Okay. Yeah, where something down in that pile of shifting goo changed and breaks everything that depends on it. Mm -hmm. um, well, it, it prevent. It's more involved in that actually. But OSGI is an attempt to fix that by by allowing you to build components where the versioning problem is nailed down and and at least known if not resolved okay that uh, OSGI was the name of the project that invented the approach that approach was eventually adopted and and is being adopted into the Java core okay in a project whose name I now forget um, it's not quite available yet, but it's it's hoped for in the next release. Okay. Wish I could think of the name. <laughs> but OSGI, you can think of it as a way to solve the technical complications of building a component-based system. Right. Now, JBI, uh, Java Business Integration. I'm not sure that's still alive. Because huh. I haven't heard about it for years, but I, I was interested in that as a way of, of using components that can be snapped together with a very simple pipeline kind of a metaphor. Mm -hmm. um, you can think of it as like pipe, uh, copper pipes in a plumbing system. Oh, right. That's another metaphor. Plumbing, you'd use that metaphor in your papers also. Yeah, right. <laughs> but um, you could, uh, it's stream-based programming, basically, where the components are stream, are stream processors, filters uh -huh. and water heaters and you know things of that nature. JBI was uh, one of the things I p tried to support that approach before it vanished. I think it it may have died with sun maybe of what happened. Oh, okay. To it. And you mentioned another one. Uh, SCA software component architecture. Oh, it, that uh, was a part of the JBI oh, okay. approach. Okay. Um, it seemed like a lot of this, this stuff that these this level of. So, you identified. Um, I think you are identifying at this point that the problem is creating trust for components. So rather than selling bits, we need to sell 
trust in the components. And that's one of the problems that software ICs didn't, didn't succeed was because you couldn't necessarily trust the components. Well, it's, it's, it's hard to, to be that simple about it because um, what, does, what does it take to, for, to go from, let's say, mud and sand houses to, to brick houses? Mm -hmm. Well, it, it's a whole lot of stuff that took us millennia to do. You know, let's say it started with the Romans. We had to invent standards, then we had to invent standards bodies, and we had to invent testing labs. Mm -hmm. We had to find ways to um, incentivize all of those very costly kinds of efforts. Mm -hmm. And it took millennia to do it with simple stuff like steel mm -hmm. and bricks. So, and now the result of all of those standards and all of those tests is trust. Right. But trust is what comes out of the pipe, whereas what goes into it is millennia of trying things. And um, so I think that's what I was trying to articulate. Huh. So are you saying that we need an, a millennium of of uh, experience in software before we can fully trust software components? I, th I think so, and probably more than a millennia because we, we carry such a liability in incentivizing hmm. the production of, of software. Because the market mechanisms aren't, aren't there or are not cor the yeah, correct ones? Yeah, because it's so hard. To, without scarcity, what will replace it? Right. Well, maybe... Um, Maybe, maybe the answer is cloud computing. Mm -hmm. Well, that's barely here today. Uh, maybe, maybe the millennia starts today and goes goes into the future. But I'm not. I'm not an optimist because hmm. it's such a liability, hmm. um, economics-wise, that that we're carrying with us. So you don't think that. This that trust can be created. You think that trust has to just emerge naturally, or evolve is better. Evolve, better word. Right. Yeah, I think so. Because I don't know about you, but the idea of um, putting a computer in charge of driving a car <laughs> is is just. I can't express the level of idiocy that represents to me. <laughs> I don't trust it. I have never met a computer I trust more than. You know, they, they don't deserve trust. <laughs> so, well, so you, I mean, <laughs> so you're, you're pretty skeptical of, uh, of AI then? <laughs> or machine learning? <laughs> Don't get me started on AI. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't put your life in its hands. No. <laughs> okay. And remember, this is what I do for a living. Right. <laughs> you know, machine learning. And oh, is that what you're working on now? Yeah. Is machine learning? Well, cyber, cyber computing. Mm -hmm. uh, machine learning for cyber protection. For security. Yeah. Ah. But uh, as far as trusting it, I, I would never use that word. Okay. You know, for all the reasons we talked about, it's complicated. Um, uh, um, steel, I would trust. So <laughs> computer programs, I don't. Okay. Steel, I trust because there's standards, because it's tested, because it's un it's been experienced over millennia. Mm -hmm. None of those are true of software. I see. Hmm. But if we did have those standards and a millennium of experience, then maybe we would get to that point where we trust the software. That's a maybe. That's a maybe. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, interesting. So uh, another uh, since you, we talked about AI, so uh, you've also said that you don't get along with uh, Lisp or Haskell or other functional languages. Is that still true? Oh gosh, that doesn't sound like something I'd say literally. 
but maybe <laughs> figuratively. Oh. Haskell, I gave it an honest try, oh. and I just couldn't I fail to understand the syntax. Mm -hmm. The idea of it is, yeah, that's an important I idea, stream processing, basically, or functional programming. Oh. But I can I can do that in a, a simple language like Java without putting up with the pain of of learning a totally new syntax. Mm -hmm. So I tried, but I, I failed to understand it. So it's just mostly the syntax and the mm -hmm. the way of thinking is to to aim. and the way they 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 don't seem to they the people who promote Haskell don't seem to be able to put three sentences together without a word like monads, <laughs> which doesn't help you to climb the curve. Right. Yeah. Did you have similar issues with Lisp? I don't feel like I did. Lisp um, just got parentheses in the wrong place, but, uh, you know, that you can cope with. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what do you, what do you think of uh, what Apple has done with Objective-C in the last uh, dec couple of decades? Oh, they've done miracles. <laughs> um, it, it's frankly been wonderful to watch mm -hmm. to watch what they're doing. Have you ever written code using Apple's Objective-C? I had one project, um, an iPhone project. Mm -hmm. um, I was impressed. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think of uh, Apple's new Swift language? Tell you the truth, I've not I've come around over time to the to the view that what what this world needs isn't more languages. <laughs> right. So every time something new comes out, I don't, I don't uh, rush to 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 learn it. Mm -hmm. And that was my reaction to Swift. I I just didn't learn it because I've got all the work I can do right now with the, with the language that I do know, mm -hmm. Java, mm -hmm. and. Um, that's where I've concentrated. Mm -hmm. Sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, so um, I mean, you mentioned that right now you're 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 doing uh, stuff in machine learning and security, um, mm -hmm. and so could you elaborate on what uh, what your current work is? Well, um, it's basically to detect get as early a warning as possible of attacks that are underway uh -huh. like hacking yeah very many of our clients are government clients right. and um, they're exposed and um, you know attacks unfold it takes months to complete an, an attack from doing the reconnaissance to collecting, you know, learning how, how a network is put together from outside to uh, actually carrying out some attack and, ex and exporting, exfiltrating the results. To, it can take months to, to do, to complete that chain. And uh, we're trying to break into that chain early and get raised an alert of exactly where in the attack process mm -hmm. things are right now, and uh, here's how to head off the next steps. Mm -hmm. um, there's a desire to apply machine learning to that problem. Mm -hmm. um, many of the ideas there are yet to be proven. There are people who've tried it, but I, I don't know that anybody claims to have successfully uh, explore that approach. But that's part of our goal. I see. 
And this is a, a company that sometimes contracts with the government? Yeah. Okay. And so was this a natural outgrowth of your previous government work? Or? I, I, I would say it's, yeah, um, but also back to remember the, um, the, that uh, work in, um, that early work in machine le learning uh, neural networks at oh. the University of Chicago. Oh, right. That's coming back, exactly. That's coming back, and I uh, keep looking for a, a way to, to get back in touch with that. Right. I haven't found it yet, but um, I, keep, I keep hoping. Right. that I can uh, head back in that direction. Maybe someday. So the machine learning is a way to get back to that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. So do you consider yourself more of a academic or an industry person and do you consider yourself more of a social scientist or an economist than a computer mm -hmm. scientist or a software engineer? Well, no to the last two because those don't exist. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, most of my career I've called myself a software developer. Recently, increasingly, I'm um, getting more and more aligned with the data science data mm -hmm. scientist. Uh, Analytics, big data. Yeah. But I, st I still do software development to do that. Mm -hmm. Certainly not academic. <laughs> I, d I didn't enjoy academia mm -hmm. at all. Okay. Um, so you, a lot of your career has been about in, uh, higher levels of encapsulation components, larger granularity. Um, is that sort of most of your career, we would say, is has been focused on that? And is that an accurate statement? Uh, it, it, I would say it's been motivated by desire for that, certainly. I, I don't feel I've been totally successful at that because of the business model issues, but right. uh, where those issues are resolvable, like for cloud computing and for Apple's um, in a little niche, <coughs> you know, I, I can feel like, feel some success from those. Mm -hmm. um, Are there problems that components don't solve uh, in software? I could give a flip answer and say you have, <laughs> they don't cure cancer. <laughs> <laughs> in software then? Well, let's, uh, let me just think out loud for a second. In hardware, are there, com are there problems that components don't solve? Mm. Well, probably, probably, yeah. I mean. Um, um, nothing solves everything, mm -hmm. but I'm not being responsive. Okay. I'm beginning to see the real problem. See, see the the problem that needs to be most solved is not so much productivity as complexity. Ah. And. Uh, Components are a real help with that, but I'm not sure they solve that. I see. They're, they're always unsolved things at the edges of the things that you do solve. Right. And um, the complexity problem. I, I, I can't imagine that, that that can ever be solved. Hmm. Well, where do you think, um, where do you think uh, programming languages specifically or components or the software industry in general 
is going or should be going. Oh, Lord. I almost wish they wouldn't. There wasn't a software industry? No, that, that they wouldn't be. I'm not sure the answer to anything is more languages. Uh-huh. So I, so I meant to say I, I wish the industry wouldn't even do it. Do more languages. Do more languages. It's like more languages. It's like more human languages. Why would you want more human languages? <laughs> if you've got um, the old British sets of weights and measures, is adding metric systems to that not just making things worse, adding languages, adding st systems, adding incompatible standards. I don't see it as a solution to anything. It's, it's a way of making the problem harder. But wouldn't you say that, I mean, like human languages, social needs change, and so the new languages better address those needs than the old ones? Mm. You, yeah, you're probably you're probably right, um, but I was thinking about different languages, French and German and right. Latin and all of that. Is that an advantage or or a liability? In it? The Tower of Babel, you mean? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The incompatibility between the right. different languages. But, um, you know, I know I'm tilting it with Mel Sarah that <laughs> this industry is going to spew languages as long as it's <laughs> got a life to spew. What about um, software in general? Where do you think it, it's going or should be going? Those there's a fellow at, at HP Labs. Um, his name I've forgotten. But he's sort, sort of leading the charge for something called capability-based architectures. Mm -hmm. do, you know, do you know what that means, um, technically? I've heard of it, but I, I'm not that familiar with it. Well, that. Ken Ham Hammerhodge, as I mentioned him earlier, mm -hmm. um, put me onto this idea. He, he was involved very much in building capability machines at Plexi in, in Britain before he came over here. And um, the fellow at HP, whose name I've forgotten, takes a game of solitaire as an example of an extremely powerful program. It's a program that can uh, write checks, it can um, write defaming letters to your boss. Huh. The program can do anything you can do because Solitaire has exactly the same privileges that you have on your computer and can do any, literally anything that you can do. So it's a very powerful program. And that notion of power that you, the computer owner, delegate to every program that you have on your computer is the foundation of how computers work. Mm -hmm. Well, that to me seems like, like a, not a kind of foundation you want to trust. <laughs> and that's basically the point of all of this and the point of this desire to switch to a capability based system. Well, the problem goes from there to the, from the computer, trusting the computer, to trusting the network mm -hmm. that joins computers together, which seems even more untrustworthy. Right. So, where do I think computer software is, is heading? It's heading to a recognition that we're building on a on an untrustable foundation, huh. and hopefully a determination to do something about it. I see. So the capabilities-based system 
It doesn't solve the problem of trust, it just makes it worse? No, that, that's, that's a technical solution to the problem. Oh, to the trust problem. Right. Is by imbuing these programs with, with more power? With, or, with limitations oh, on limitations their power. Oh, limitations to their yeah. power. Okay. You're building in limitations to their power. Right. And therefore, that allows you to trust it more. Right. Okay. I see. Um, you've mentioned Ken Hammerhodges a lot. What's, what's been your relationship with him over the years? Uh, he's just a very good friend. Uh, he worked, um, he was at ITT, head of the research, the development labs there. They joined Stepstone and, you know, we've kept in touch over mm -hmm. the years. Okay. Right. My last question, um, so what advice would you give to a young person today? Of course, a young person interested in computers. Oh, Lord. Um. I, I've got great hopes for the Spark environment. Spark. Right. And I, I think I would advise um, a youngster to get started down that trail. It's a very painful road. Spark is pretty awful right now. Is that, a, but, is that an acronym? Spark? No, it's... Um, S P A R K or S P A R K. It's it's uh, it's basically after Hadoop. You you know what Hadoop is? Uh, it's it's I've heard they're of they're real big in the big data world. Oh, okay. They're the foundation for big data work. Okay, so it's a machine learning data analytics kind of a thing that goes on top of Spark. But yes, uh, Spark oh, is Spark is the platform on which those things are based. Yes. Okay. So at the foundation down at the bottom is a loop, which is um, a storage um, and remote execution environment. Okay. It works in a distributed network. And then Spark runs on top of that. Okay. To support a streaming approach to computation. Hmm. Remember the pipes and filters I was talking about earlier? Mm -hmm. They they recur in that space right. and then there are machine learning libraries that, that will run on top of Spark. I see. So it's a very comp complicated and difficult environment but um, I think that's where I would point uh, youngsters because big data is not getting any smaller and <laughs> there'll be a, a job there for them. Right. So uh, AI not necessarily the. <laughs> the it's place not to get my it. not my favorite. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right. But it was it was basically um, my frustration with AI that got me into that um, um, the neural network approach to right. computing. trying to articulate why I felt so uncomfortable about AI mm -hmm. by doing that work. Right. Um, it's really classic, that's classic rule-based rule AI. Yeah. Right. right. Um, but, I mean, current, like, machine learning is not the same thing as... Oh, no. no that's, but, more, that's more I, I view that as vindication. Oh, okay. What I thought back in graduate school. Oh, okay. So, like, what... So, machine learning using sort of neural nets is is now the new form of AI, well, in a way. Yeah, that label has been pushed in that direction. <laughs> <laughs> but you're not fully comfortable with that label? Well, it, it, well it's just rule-based. What I didn't like was this idea of rule-based okay. as leading to any new knowledge right. about how biological systems work. Right. Because they don't do it that way. Right. <laughs> but the neural nets approach, that's the way to go. 
I, I, so I believe. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and you think that uh, sort of these um, sort of autonomous learning machines will, do you think they'll eventually take over the world or do you think? Oh. <laughs> I, no, I don't. <laughs> so they're, they have inherent limitations? Or how do we control them when we don't even know exactly what they're doing? Pull the plug. <laughs> <laughs> what if they're just out there on the network? Uh, Self-replicating. <laughs> I, I, um, sorry, that, that just doesn't compute for me. <laughs> the idea that something as dumb as a brick can be that kind of a threat. Mm -hmm. I, I just it just doesn't compute to me. Okay. I mean, so you pull the plug and kill it. Okay. It, it's like. Uh, it, so we're not okay. So you don't you don't agree with the the Bill Gateses or the the Elon Musk who are worried about smart AI taking not, over. Not at all. Okay. <laughs> not going to be a problem. Okay. Well, that's it for my questions, and thank you very much for giving All us right. your time and inviting us to your lovely home. Thank you very much.